Good morning, everyone. It's lovely to see you on uh, this Sunday morning. Breaking with tradition, we're starting on time. So uh, welcome. Well done for getting here. Uh, that's fantastic. A few notices, as you would expect, um, on Sunday morning. If you're a visitor here, fantastic to see you. You're really, really welcome um, at our services here. We have tea and coffee in the back hall afterwards for refreshments. Please do make yourself known to us. Enjoy some fellowship with us um, as well. So it's lovely to have you here, uh, and you're very welcome uh, to be among us. A um, couple of other things. Um, the Messy Church team and the elders in the church just want to say a huge thank you to all those people that helped yesterday. Um, numbers we don't know yet, which is probably a good thing. It probably means there's more than what uh, there sometimes is. So thank you for all the effort, all the work uh, that was put into the Messy Church event yesterday afternoon. Um, things happening this week as well. Firstly, I have a solution, you're pleased to hear, to the depression and the sadness that you may have this afternoon and this evening. And that is by coming to church instead of watching the TV and the football. And I really would say, come along to church this evening, because we have got a visiting speaker called Stuart McDermott coming to talk to us about Mormonism. So if you want to know about that, if you want to know how that can be uh, something that we can learn from, how we can actually talk to Mormons about their faith and about our faith intelligently, then please do come this, uh, this evening, 5.30 for refreshments in the back hall, 6 o'clock to start the service. And I guarantee you'll have a better time and a more edifying time than doing anything else that you possibly could. Stuart is also from South Wales, so that probably explains why he's not bothered um, about watching England play this afternoon as well. We have our youth group on Monday evening, um, and the home groups uh, Tuesday during the day, when, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday in the evenings, um, and you should get something from your home group leaders. If you're not part of a home group who would like to be, please see Christian, um, and he can link you to one of the home groups that's nearest to you. Or if you can't get to the one that's nearest to you, please feel free to attend the one uh, that you can do during the week. There is a certain amount of flexibility there. Christian sometimes when he comes up and says things, he says things like the young, young people and the, the babies even can teach us something about our Christian faith, can teach us something about how we live. I'm going to go one further because during my holiday, a dog taught me something about the Christian faith and how I would actually react as well. We went on a holiday with all our family, so Jacob, Charlotte, uh, James, Beth, Karis, Sharon and myself, we had a great time and we took their dog. Their dog is a red fox Labrador like we have got. And I think it's just a trait in red fox Labradors that you put the lead on, you open the door, and they're gone like that before you can think. They pull on the lead and they're so desperate to get to the next thing. They, they want to go what's around the corner, they don't want what's further down the road. They're so desperate to keep going that they actually miss so much that's right in front of them. And I think that's just like us so times, isn't it? We're so desperate for the next thing. We're so desperate to get to that point. We're so desperate for the new house, the new car, the new job. We're so desperate to be parents or grandparents or great-grandparents. So desperate to get to retirement. So desperate for everything that we actually miss the moment that we are now in. And that's what the dog goes. He goes running off, but actually misses the point of where they're at now. And we're in danger of doing that. We're in danger of doing that even on Sundays where we think of what's happening tomorrow, what's happening during the week, where we just need to stop. We just need to do what verse 10 of, of Psalm 46 says, be still and know that he is God. Amen. To sit and still and be still and know that he is God. Let's just pray before we start our service together. Father, we confess that we are sometimes just like dogs desperate to get to the next thing, and not taking notice of where we are at now. We look forward to so many things that are going to happen and miss what's right in front of our eyes. The beauty of your creation in the spring and the summer and the autumn and the winter. The wonder of being with our family and our friends. The joy of being together in fellowship and, and listening to your word on Sundays. The great times that we can have during the week as we, we study your word both privately and together as your people. Our Father, we pray, please, that we might just enjoy the moment we are in rather than looking so far ahead into the future to things that may not even happen. Oh, Father, we pray this morning that you will take out of our minds all the things that would want to crowd in from what may happen during the week and that you would just fill us with your love and your grace and your mercy, that we'll be assured of what we are as believers. Father, we pray, please, that you will help us this morning just to be still to know that you are God and there is none other beside you. Help us in this, we pray, because we ask it in and through our Saviour's name. 
Amen. Amen. Well, we're going to sing two hymns together, one after the other. One is Praise is Rising, Hosanna, and then straight into There is a Higher Throne. And then after that, Warren is going to come and do our children's slot. So Hosanna, Praise is Rising, There is a Higher Throne, and then the children's slot.
Okay, good, good morning. Um, really good to see you all here this morning. Did, did you have fun at the, at the messy, messy summer yesterday? Yes. Yeah? Henry's come back with a black eye. It was, it was, I, I certainly had a lot of fun. Um, so thanks for Pat and Shirley. I think you did an amazing job. Um, my personal highlight was probably Finch at the end, stood in the hooker duck pond, just scooping up buckets of water and tipping them over his head. Um, what, what a lad. Um, but yeah, it was, it, was, it was a lot of fun. Okay. I've got a, um, a question for you this morning. Um, yeah, I don't need you to, to shout out, just have a think about it, mull it over over the next few minutes. And that is, what's the biggest question you've ever been asked? Okay, what's the biggest question you've ever been asked? I th I've been thinking about this this week, and I think the general rule kind of is, the older we get, the bigger the question kinds of get. get. So if, if you think about little Tobias, CEC, we all know Tobias, I'm, I'm guessing that Sean and Charlotte haven't gone Look, Tobias, there's a general election coming up. We've printed off all the manifestos. We've highlighted to bring to your attention all the childcare policies. Who do you think we should vote for in North Herefordshire? Come on, we need an answer. I, I suspect the biggest question Tobias has been asked is stuff like, have you done a poo in your nappy? <laughs> yeah? That's probably about as big as it gets. And getting a bit older to, to Henry and Beth, I think the biggest question they've probably been asked is when the ice cream van would come round our village last summer, felt like every day comes at like half or five o'clock right on tea time, which is brilliant. Um, occasionally we'd get one and like the lady would get like the, the whippy ice cream and then, and then she'd ask the question. She, she'd point to like the, the picture in the window with like 30 combinations of, of sauce and stuff and then she'd ask the question, would you like sauce and sprinkles? And these two are kind of stood there like mouth open, starry eyed and we stood there forever deciding what sauce and sprinkles we like, which if you're nine is a bigger question. Um, for Rhiannon, I think one of the biggest questions he's ever been asked was a few years ago, we were 22, it's around Christmas time, I took her out for dinner, we went for a nice walk after dinner, the stars were in the sky, and then I had to tie my shoe later. While I was down there, while I was down there, I said to him, And that's a massive question, will, will you marry me? And as we get even older, our, our health can start to fail us a bit sometimes. We have to have some really difficult conversations with our doctor, our family, about courses of treatment and things like that. And they are massive, massive questions. But the question that I'd like to put to you this morning, I think blows all those other questions out of the water. Because what ice cream sauce you have, or even what treatment you have with your doctor, only really kind of affects the here and now, maybe the next few years. But this question, how we answer that, affects all of eternity. So we'll have a quick read from um, Matthew 16. Um, and it says this. When Jesus came to the reg region of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, who do people say the Son of Man is? They replied, some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah, and still others, Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. But what about you, he asked, who do you say I am? Simon Peter answered, you are the Messiah, the son of the living God. So that's a question Jesus asked his disciples, but I'd, I'd like to flip that round to you this morning, if that's okay, and say, but, but what about you? Who, who do you say Jesus is? Because how we answer that question affects all of eternity. But what this isn't about is coming up with a clever answer, repeating some of the information you've been told, chucking in some big words to impress people. If you can do that, good for you and all that, but th this is, Jesus can see straight through that. This is about who you say in your heart, in your innermost being, who do you say that Jesus is? Um, we're going to go on a bit of a tangent now, but stay with me. We'll, we'll tie it up at the end. I genuinely had no idea Mark was going to talk about dogs. I'm going to talk about um, zebras. We don't, we don't normally, if you've not been here before, we don't normally like talk about animals all the time. It's um, just one of those things. So... We're going to talk about zebras just for a minute, okay? Now, have you ever wondered, when a baby zebra is born, it soon wants to go out and play with its zebra mates, so its mum's like, yeah, you go out and play, just be back by dark. Have you ever wondered, when that baby zebra gets back, how on earth it finds its mum in amongst all those other hundreds of zebras? Well, don't lose sleep tonight over lost baby zebras. God's designed them in a way, and this is a grevy zebra, a certain species that, that does this. Each, each of these gravy zebra, they have a unique strike pattern. So you know like our, our fingerprints are all 
all unique to us. The, the stripes on the zebra, particularly on its face, are all unique to, to that particular zebra. So what, it's, what the mum zebra does, soon after the baby's born, it takes that baby away from the rest of the herd, and it's called imprinting, where that baby has to look into its mum's face, lift its eyes from itself, look into its mother's eyes, learn its voice, so it knows that's my mum. And only when it knows that that's my mum is it allowed into the rest of the herd. Because if it doesn't do that, it's at risk of being um, lost, led astray, or even attacked. So I think we can learn a thing or two about zebras. Because what we can learn is how vital it is to take some time away from the herd, herd, away from the world, and turn our eyes to Jesus and get our eyes fixed on him. So then we have the assurance that I'm a child of God. So I think we can be more zebra, to take some time away from the world, away from your tablet and TV, and set our eyes on him. And he's given us a book we can spend time in to read and see who he says he is. Then we can know deep in our hearts the security of who we are and who we, who we are in him. Okay, here's some, here's some wisdom for you, okay? It's wisdom calling. Thanks, thanks, Karis. Oh, that's that just that's wisdom calling, okay? <laughs> this is what wisdom says. Ecclesiastes 12, verse 1. Remember your creator in the days of your youth, before the days of trouble come and the years approach when you will say, I find no pleasure in them. Because you guys are so young. And life gets really hard sometimes. And kind of where we started, that the questions we get asked as we get older, they get bigger and they get tougher. But can I let you into a secret? I, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm, I'm going to tell them. Okay, I'll let you into a secret. You guys have all got something that most of the adults haven't got, okay? But they really want what you've got, okay? They really want it. And that thing is heroic energy. You guys are relentless. You just don't stop. And you go to school and you just like learn everything so fast. You soak it all up like sponges. You come to church, you're like twizzling out on the bars, doing all your handstands and your cartwheels and stuff. Like you make us tired and ache just watching you, okay? <laughs> so, so would you or could you? I, I challenge you to use some of that energy to go after Jesus, to fix your eyes on him, to, to get to know him and learn who he is. And because the reason that's so important is because wherever you end up or, or whatever situation you might find yourself in when you're older, if you spent that time and you know who your Heavenly Father is, you'll know in those situations that I'm a child of God, I've been bought with a price, and I'm safe in the, in the palm of his hand. Um, I'm going to pray for you guys now, if that's all right. Is that okay? Yeah, I'll, I'll take that as a yes. Um, <laughs> Adults, they, these aren't my words, these are, these are Paul's words from, from Ephesians 3 that I, I thought we could pray for these guys. So if, uh, if at the end you, you agree, you can, you can say amen. So uh, let's pray. <coughs> Heavenly Father, we pray for the children and teenagers here at Wellington. We pray that out of your glorious riches you may strengthen them with power through your spirit in their inner being so that Christ may dwell in their hearts through faith. And we pray that they, being rooted and established in love, may have power, together with all your people, to grasp how wide and long and high and deep is the love of Christ. And to know this love that surpasses knowledge, that they may be filled to the measure of all the fullness of you. Now to him, who is able to do immeasurably more than we ask or imagine, according to his power that is at work within us. To him be the glory in the church, and in Christ Jesus through all generations and ever, forever and ever. Amen. 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 One more quick thing, if that's okay, just, just for one minute. If you haven't got a Scooby-Doo, what I've been going on about, about ice cream sauce, Jesus and zebras, okay? Firstly, I apologise. Secondly, if you're thinking, well, I, I don't know who, who I say Jesus is, as an incredibly brief introduction to Jesus, okay? He is the most influential man that's ever lived. He's God's son. We can read about him in the Bible. The whole, the whole Bible's centred around him. It all points to him. And the Bible's the best-selling book of all time ever, year on year. Harry Potter doesn't even come close. The date today is 30th of June, 2024. So that's 2024 since Jesus' birth. So time is centred around him. The calendar on your phone revolves around him. 
millions of people are meeting today, just like you, to worship him, to, to learn more about him, not to mention the billions of lives that have been transformed by his own overwhelming love he has for you and the forgiveness of sin that can be found through his death and resurrection. So surely, surely, you, you owe it to yourself to find out a bit about this Jesus, someone that influential, to see what he had to say, to see who you say this Jesus is. Because um, Netflix will still be there when you get back, okay? Facebook, YouTube, they're not going to miss you when you're gone. To be practical just for a minute, I'm not saying that we all need to live like monks or nuns or something like that. Just start with five minutes a day. Just see who Jesus is, see who he says he is, and get to know him. And it can grow if you want to do more, you go for that, okay? But take some time away from the world, like the zebra, and fix our eyes on Jesus. I'm going to come back to Mark. Thanks, Mark. Oh, thanks, Warren. That was, that was great. And um, Christian, you've got something to follow now with some animal story, OK? <laughs> I've got a second bit of good news for you today. And that is, when you wake up on Friday morning, things won't have changed very much. <laughs> I hate to disappoint you, but it doesn't matter what colour goes through that black door, things will not have changed very much. But why are we so fearful? Why do they want to portray fear to us all the time? That seems to be the biggest message that's coming out of the election promises at the moment is the fearfulness of what's happening in the world, the fearfulness about what's happening financially. And they want to sort of make us fearful so much that we have to vote for that particular group or party. But whoever does go through that black door on Friday, things will not really change very much. And you know why? Because he is sovereign. Our God is the one who is in control. It's just that at the moment the politicians don't realise that. Our prayer is that one day they will. They will realise that they have no control except for God in heaven giving them the power and the control that they have. Psalm 46 says, God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. Therefore we will not fear, though the earth gives way, though the mountains be moved into the hearts of the sea, though its waters roar and form through the mountains tremble at its swelling. Then verse 6, the nations rage. The kingdoms totter, he utters his voice, the earth melts. Why? Because our God is our strength and refuge. We have nothing to fear, nothing to fear if we are in him. And that's picked up in our next hymn that we are going to sing, Whom Shall I Fear? God's Angel Armies. And we'll stand and sing this together. Sunday school and crèche, but the teens stay in, they'll be going out after the next hymn.
Well, let's just pray for the young people and the leaders as uh, they go out to their various classes. Uh, now, we certainly don't take in this church for granted the fact that we have a, a large number of children here, and um, God's been very kind to us in, in giving those under our care. So we need to pray for them and for those that lead them and teach them in the various classes. So let's just pray now. Father, again, we thank you for the children we have in this place. We thank you that you brought them here to be under our care, to be taught by us uh, the wonders and riches of your, your love and grace and mercy towards them. So we would pray for Warren and Rhiannon as they go into the Sunday school with the, teach, the, the children now, that you would give them the words to say to these young people, that they would explain your wonderful gospel in a way that they can understand, that the way that they can grasp hold of it. Father, we would pray for them. We know how the world would want to bombard them with things that are not helpful to them. So we would pray again, as we have prayed before, that you would remove from their hearts and minds what the world teaches, and you would instill into their hearts and minds what you teach them. Father, be with them, we pray. Bless them. Be with them, we pray. In casket, in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. We're going to have our reading now. Acts chapter 4. Acts chapter 4. It'll be on the screen, or you can get it in the church Bibles as well. Acts chapter 4, and it talks about the boldness of Peter and John before the Sanhedrin council. Starting at verse 1, going through to verse 31. Acts chapter 4. And as they were speaking to the people, the priests and the captain of the temple and the Sadducees came upon them, greatly annoyed because they were teaching the people and proclaiming in Jesus the resurrection from the dead. And they arrested them and put them in custody until the next day, for it was already evening. But many of those who had heard the word believed, and the number of men came to about 5,000. On the next day, their rulers and elders and scribes gathered together in Jerusalem with Annas, the high priest, and Caiaphas, and John and Alexander, and all who were of the high priestly family. And when they had set them in the middle, they inquired, by what power or by what name did you do this? Then Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, said to them, rulers of the people and elders, if we are being examined today concerning a good deed done to a crippled man, by what means this man has been healed, let it be known to all of you and to all the people of Israel that by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified, whom God raised from the death, by him this man is standing well before you. This Jesus is the stone that was rejected by you, the builders, which has become the cornerstone. And there is salvation in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. And when they saw the boldness of Peter and John and perceived that they were uneducated, common men, they were astonished and they recognised that they had been with Jesus. But seeing the man who was healing standing beside them, and they had nothing to say in opposition. But when they had commanded them to leave the council, they conferred with one another, saying, What shall we do with these men? For a notable sign has been performed through them, and it's evident to all the inhabitants of Jerusalem, and we cannot deny it. But in order that it may spread no further among the people, let us warn them to speak no more to anyone about this name. So they called them and charged them not to speak or teach at all in the name of Jesus. But Peter and John answered them, Whether it is right in the sight of God to listen to you rather than God, you must judge. For we cannot but speak of what we have seen and heard. And when they had further threatened them, they let them go, finding no way to punish them because of the people. For all were praising God for what had happened. For the man on whose sign of healing was performed was no more than 40 years old. When they were released, they went to their friends and reported what the chief priests and the elders had said to them. When they heard it, they lifted their voices together to God and said, Sovereign Lord, who made the heavens and the earth and the sea and everything in them, who through the mouth of our father David, your servant, said by the Holy Spirit, Why did the Gentiles rage and the people plot in vain? The kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers were gathered together against the Lord and against his anointed. For truly, in this city, 
they were gathered together against your holy servant Jesus, whom you anointed, both Herod and Pontius Pilate, along with the Gentiles and the people of Israel, to do whatever your hand and your plan had predestined them to do. And now, Lord, look upon their threats and grant to your servants to speak continually with words of boldness. While you stretch out your hand to heal, and signs and wonders were performed through the name of your holy servant Jesus. And when they had prayed, in the place that they were gathering together was shaken, and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit, and continued to speak the word of God with boldness. Well, before Christian comes and preaches God's word to us, we're going to pray, and then we're going to sing our next hymn together, O Church Arise. Father, this passage which we have just read is such a challenge to us because so often we can be incredibly timid in the way that we try and teach and share our Christian faith to others. We try and maybe speak words, but they don't come out as we want them to come out, or we feel shy and embarrassed about what we know to be true, scared and worried about what the reaction is going to be from those people that we are speaking to. Father, this passage tells us of Peter and John who went out boldly proclaiming the gospel of Jesus Christ. So as we think about this passage shortly, and as we maybe mull on it over the next weeks and months, as we continue to Acts, Father, we pray that we may also have that amazing boldness to be able to declare the wonderful riches of Jesus Christ to those that would listen to us. Give us those opportunities, we pray, that we may say things to others that may challenge them to think about Jesus and what he has done. Father, be with Christian, and we thank you for the time that he's spent studying your words and preparing this sermon for us. Father, be with him and be with us, that you'll open our hearts and minds to be attentive to what he has to say, knowing that the words he speaks are not just his babbling words, but are words from yourself through him. Help us, we pray in Christ's name. Amen. So we're going to sing our next hymn, O Church, arise and put your armour on. Hear the call of Christ our Captain. Let's stand and sing this hymn together.
Good morning. I thought that the last couple of months had been quite busy in the Diamond household. Um, I had a minor operation. We went on holiday. We moved house. We had three foster children move in with us alongside our five children, as well as trying to, to lead the church. I thought we were busy enough, but apparently not. So yesterday we got a puppy. <laughs> That is all I'd like to say about that. <laughs> That's the animal contribution. So let's move on. Last week we looked at walking with Jesus, and this week we're going to look at walking with boldness. And we're going to split it up into two points again. Um, so last week we looked at the miracle and the message, and this week we're going to look at the persecution and the prayer. The persecution and the prayer. 2 Timothy chapter 3 says, All who desire to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. That doesn't say all who live a godly life will be persecuted. It says all who desire to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. Even if you want to live a godly life, you will be attacked. Because we try, don't we, to live godly lives, to honour God in our lives, but we don't always do that. We fail, we fall short. But even having that desire presents you with a big target on your back, you will be persecuted. The opposition that we read about here in chapter 4, uh, priests, captain of the temple guard, and Sadducees. We'll just mention a little bit about these three groups. So the, the high priest, or former high priest, Anas, he's, he's mentioned, um, his family had quite a say as high priest. So four of his sons also held that position at one time. And now that the current high priest, Caiaphas, that's Annas' son-in-law. So despite him stepping back and his son's taking over, and now his son-in-law taking over, he's still the one pulling the strings behind the scenes. And Luke acknowledges that in the scriptures because it still refers to him as high priest. Because he's still doing the role. And his name says it all and kind of reflects what comes out of him, really. I'll leave you to figure that one out. <laughs> then we get the, ca the captain of the temple guard. So these were the guys who were responsible for maintaining peace and order inside the temple and just outside the temple. And while they're doing that, they're conscious that Rome is looking over their shoulder as well. But really the focus of, of this chapter are the Sadducees. And they trace their origin back to, to Zadok, son of Aaron, the high priest who was under, under Solomon. And they craved power. So politically, they were very influential, they were aristocratic, they were materialistic, and they were in bed with Rome. They were like religious mob bosses. That's how they're presented here in Acts. But even mob bosses have their own insecurities, have certain things that really trigger them. Sensitivities. Uh, I remember watching a, a movie some years ago and there was this, uh, well, a few guys who were going in to talk with these other group of guys and the leader of these other group of guys were kind of the Irish mob of that particular era. I think it was in Chicago. And as they were about to walk in and meet with John, who was the, the mob leader, one of the guys said to him, look, whatever you do, don't call him Little John. Just don't call him Little John. That, that triggers him. He goes mental. So they walk in into this little cabin and he looks him in the eye and says, Hey, Little John. And you just see the guy's face goes red. He starts swearing. He gets angry. It all gets very violent. It triggered him. The trigger for the Sadducees was mentioned in the resurrection. That was their trigger word. They get all red-faced, all angry, start getting aggressive. They were a cult that denied all miracles, especially the resurrection. They only accepted the Torah, so they only accepted the first five books 
of the Bible as authoritative, as from God. And in their interpretation of the Torah, there was no miracles. I don't know how you can read <laughs> the first five books of the Bible and see no, nothing miraculous. But that's what they taught. That's what they believed. And that's why their challenge to Jesus is absolutely hilarious in Matthew 22. They try and catch Jesus out. So they try and present Jesus with a, a difficult question, as if there are any difficult questions for Jesus. And so what Jesus does in Matthew 22 is he answers their question, and then he says, as for the resurrection of the dead, have you not read what was said to you by God? I am the God of Abraham and the God of Isaac and the God of Jacob. Very deliberate what Jesus is doing. He quotes Exodus, one of the first five books of the Bible. And he says, I am the God, not I was the God. In other words, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob are alive because they have risen. They've been resurrected. And now here in Acts, the Sadducees are hearing that Jesus has defied them again in the worst of ways. He has actually been resurrected. He's no longer just teaching about the resurrection. He has been resurrected. And this just is an epitome of Jesus, isn't it? He doesn't just talk the talk. He walks the walk. He matched all of his words with actions. So they're not too pleased about this. And this kind of gathering of these different groups, the, the high priest, the captain, the Sadducees, these kind of temple gangsters were known as the Sanhedrin. There were 71 of them. They were leaders in politics, in, in religion, in academia. And these same religious gangsters had gathered together a few weeks earlier, early on a Friday morning, desperately trying to find fault with an innocent, miracle-working God-man, Jesus. It's the same group of people that were grilling Jesus, putting him on trial. And now they're doing the same with the apostles. So these are the men who murdered the Lord Jesus Christ. And now, despite them thinking they've taken care of Jesus, it's as if he's still around. And his presence has multiplied somehow. Miracles are happening. The lame man is there with Peter and John. Standing there with them. He'd never been able to walk his whole life. And he's there with them. And so they say, by what power or by what name did you do this? Their own power or even the power of Rome couldn't match this miracle. Can you imagine if Rome had the power to make injured people walk again? Imagine what kind of opportunities that would present on the battlefield. Somebody gets injured or wounded. In the name of Rome, I say rise up. And the soldiers healed again. They didn't know that kind of power. They wanted it, but it wasn't available to them. The apostles are in the dock getting grilled, but are they intimidated by the men who crucified Jesus? I would be, I'm pretty sure. They actually switch things up, and they go on the offensive. The Sanhedrin think that the apostles are on trial, but actually they're in God's court now. They're the ones that are on trial. And the first thing Peter notes is how strange it is to be arrested and jailed and questioned about an act of kindness. Why is that a bad thing? How can that be a bad thing? And then he tells them, Jesus did this miracle. You killed him. God raised him up. And then he goes a step further. He quotes a very provocative scripture. Psalm 118, verse 22. The stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. This was widely acknowledged as a, a messianic psalm, describing that the crucial moment when God would, would save his people from their sin, but the leaders, the builders of the nation, would reject him. And Peter's saying, 
Jesus is that Lord and Messiah of Psalm 118. The Hebrew of verse 14 is literally, the Lord is my strength and my song. He has become my Yeshua. Jesus. Salvation. He has become my salvation. If you want to know more about that and witnessing to uh, Jews, go on Jews for Jesus and they, they refer to this quite a lot on that website. Yeshua. Jesus. Salvation. It's really important. So Peter's saying, look, you might have rejected him, but God the Father hasn't. You mistreated him. God has vindicated him. You killed him. God has raised him. And he's still the cornerstone that holds everything together, that everything is built upon. The apostles are standing upon the word of God. And the formerly lame guy is standing there with them. And then comes the punchline. A very exclusive verse, a very important verse that should be at the center of all of our thinking when we're doing evangelism. There is salvation in no one else. There is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. Very, very exclusive, isn't it? There's no one else. There are not many roads that lead to heaven or lead to God. There's just one road. His name is Jesus. That's it. I was reading a, a Mark Dever book yesterday and, um, on evangelism. And he was talking about how when we avoid the full truth in our evangelism, all that creates is, is a half-hearted gospel. That's all it presents to people. And that then leads to a half-hearted commitment to Jesus, which is not real salvation at all. I agree with him. There's no other way. There's never been another way. And that refers to Old Testament Israel as well. So Old Testament believers were saved by faith in the Messiah to come, Jesus. But that's not what some people say. Some people say, no, no. Weren't they saved by obedience to God's law in the Old Testament? What? So they were Catholic in the Old Testament and it was related to good works and obedience, the Bible clearly tells us nobody completely obeyed the law. We broke one of the laws, we've broken all of them. Only Jesus completely obeyed the law. So that can't be it. Others say, no, but they were, they were saved by a promise in the Old Testament. Promises don't save people. They were saved by a person, and his name is Jesus. There's no other name. There's no other way. There never has been. There never will be. It's only Jesus. And the Bible's all about Jesus. Very, very exclusive. But the message is also very inclusive. Can't miss this. Verse 12 is really, really important. By which we must be saved. There is salvation in no one else, for there is no other name unto heaven given among men by which we must be saved. This is the apostles speaking to the Sanhedrin. Why are they putting themselves together saying, we, why are they identifying with these evil men who are rejecting Jesus? How could they do that? Because we all crucified the Christ. The apostles were just as guilty as the Sanhedrin. It's the line that I always struggle to sing. It was my sin that held him there. They can't lose that. They can't say, oh, they're the evil ones. We're the good ones, the well-behaved ones, the Christians. No, it was our sin that held him there. We sent Jesus to the cross. We killed him. And Peter and John, they're saying that. We, we did it too. We're just as bad as you. But salvation only comes by faith in his name. It's only him. They're a little bit confused at all this because they, they look at Peter and they wonder how is he providing such excellent biblical scholarship? How is he able to handle the Bible so accurately, so so powerfully because he's a numpty, he's a simpleton, he's a dunce, he's a moron, he's an uneducated man. How is this possible? 
Well, spending time in formal education is not essential, but spending time with Jesus is. He's full of the Spirit, and he's trusting his Messiah. And when we're full of the Spirit, when we're trusting Jesus, we end up looking a little bit like him. And as we learned last week, we can't just say, oh, don't look at me, look at Jesus. Yes, we, we give all the glory to Jesus, we point people to Jesus, but the world is looking at you. It's looking at us. We are the visual embodiment of Christ on earth. He is our head, he's the head of the church. He's in heaven. His body is visible on earth. The church, not the building, the people. The people of God. So when the world wants to see what Jesus looks like, they're looking at us a lot. We have to look a little bit like Jesus. We have to be full of the Spirit. We have to be giving glory to him. This persecution that's going on in Luke 4 is a fulfillment of Luke chapter 21, which says, But before all this, they will lay their hands on you and persecute you, delivering you up to the synagogues and prisons, and you will be brought before kings and governors for my name's sake. This will be your opportunity to bear witness. Settle it, therefore, in your minds, not to meditate beforehand how to answer, for I will give you a mouth and wisdom which none of your adversaries will be able to withstand or contradict. Jesus says, don't, don't worry about the level of your intelligence or, or your knowledge or anything that, like that. I will give you the words to say. I will give you all that you need. And that's what Peter's doing. He's trusting him. Peter is unrecognizable from Luke. Luke 22, where he was all talk, wasn't he? Oh, they might all deny you. They might all fall away. I won't. I'll do whatever it takes. I will lay down my life for you. What a load of rubbish. The servant girl threatened him, and he was afraid. We all criticize Judas and say, oh, well, he denied him. He denied Jesus for, for money. Well, Peter denied him because he, he wanted to hold on to his life. He feared death. Peter didn't want to die. He was scared of a servant girl, but now he's standing up to the Sanhedrin. How can this be? Well, we say he's been with Jesus, but he'd already been with Jesus for three years before he denied him. So something else has happened because Peter didn't show this boldness here in Acts 4 in Luke's Gospel. So what's happened between the servant girl and the Sanhedrin? Well, Peter had been with the risen Jesus. The resurrected Jesus. The Bible mentions at least six resurrection appearances to Peter. Peter has realized that death was a defeated enemy. It wasn't something to fear anymore. I don't need to be afraid. And somebody who's not afraid of death can be very powerful. Very, very powerful. The second thing is he's full of the Spirit, the same Spirit that led uh, David, the shepherd boy, into battle with, with the giant Goliath, the same Spirit who led the great shepherd Jesus into the wilderness against the devil. Verse 13, I'm just going to read it again, actually. Now, when they saw the boldness of Peter and John and perceived that they were uneducated common men, they were astonished and they recognized that they had been with Jesus. How does the world know that we've been with Jesus? Do we just wear a t-shirt saying, Jesus loves me? Or a cross? And I'm not saying those things are bad things. If you want to wear those things, that's up to you. But it's more than that, isn't it? The world needs to see more than that. They need to see a visible, tangible, recognizable godliness and boldness. They need to see and taste the fruit of the Spirit and the power of the Holy Spirit. And the world, when it sees that, will, will either be wowed and wooed or, or they're going to be repulsed and angered and triggered. We're going to get two very different reactions and we might be persecuted for what we say. It's very likely. 
But people need to see the impact that Jesus has had on our lives. And the apostles are then told, shut up about Jesus. Do not mention his name. Just shut up. The devil longs for us to shut up about Jesus. I've said this many times before. You can go into coffee shops in Hereford. You can chat to people on the streets. Chat to the people in toddler groups, at Let's Lunch, at youth clubs about God. Nobody cares. Nobody bats an eyelid. Because most of the people in this county think, yeah, yeah, there's maybe a God out there, but all kind of religions lead to the same old God. I'll be fine anyway. God, 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 that's fine. Mention Jesus, you'll see a very different reaction on their face. That's when people start to turn. That's when things get serious, because we're being very specific. It becomes very narrow, very exclusive. But that's why it's really important in our evangelism, isn't it? That, yes, we present a solid, full, exclusive method of salvation, person of salvation, but it's also very inclusive. It's for all. I'm just as bad. I'm no better than you. I'm just a sinner saved by grace. I just knew where to get bread. That's all. Let's read verse 19 and verse 20 again. Peter and John answered them, Whether it is right in the sight of God to listen to you rather than to God, you must judge. For we cannot but speak of what we have seen and heard. In other words, it would be sinful of us to remain silent. I just want you to think for a moment, how would you respond if you had an official government or police warning to stop mentioning Jesus? Would you be intimidated? Would you then be a little bit more careful, cautious? Maybe you call a halt to things and let things just simmer down, take a low profile. Well, what do the apostles do? Well, they, they basically say, we, we can't help it. We're probably going to do this again. And we'll see next week they are serial offenders. But what do they do in this moment? Well, they retreat. They go back to the church family. They're released. And they pray. They're persecuted. So their response, and our second point this morning, is they pray. So verses 23 to 31, the prayer. And when they report back to the flock, they get back to the church family. They, they tell them everything that's gone on about all this persecution. And the church family demonstrate really good listening skills and good empathy. They don't listen to Peter and John, give the report and say, well, that kind of sounds like a you problem, Peter. Sorry, brother. We'll pray for you. But <laughs> that they, they have that empathy. They listen carefully to what's being shared. And they launch into prayer. They don't throw a pity party. This is really important. There's a fine line, isn't there, between having empathy and then just, oh, poor, woe is me, woe is you. We're all so, it's all so bad and terrible. There's empathy, there's understanding, they listen, they care, they love them, they want to support them, and then they pray. They launch straight into prayer. And as we'll see from this prayer, this is not a prayer of, oh, poor me. It's not that at all. The other important thing is they pray together. Together. They retreat to their friends. Some translations it says their people, their own, their family. They retreat to the family. We mentioned a few weeks ago, that's the life of the Christian, isn't it? We're out on the front line, we get hurt, we get wounded, we retreat for fellowship, for breaking of bread, for teaching and for prayer. And then we get sent back out again and we get hurt and we get wounded and then we retreat. That's what's happening here. They've been persecuted. They've been shaken up a little bit. The apostles, they've stood firm. They've done really well. But now they retreat to the church family to pray together. And they do pray together. They raise their voice together. They've already been taught how to pray. Our Father. Yes, it's important to have one-to-one -one times with God. 
But it's extremely important that we pray together as Christians. It's essential. And the prayer begins with acknowledging the character of God. It's always a good way to begin our prayers. Acknowledging something of his character. We went through, didn't we, the attributes of God a couple of years ago. And the main attribute here is his sovereignty. Mark mentioned it earlier. He's in control. Whoever the politicians are, whatever the weather's like, whatever chaos is going on in the world, he's in control. And they acknowledge at the beginning of their prayer, even through this persecution and this scary stuff that's going on, even though it's exciting as well, you're in control. What a relief. He recognized that the Father has complete authority. They mention him as creator. He is the creator, and he's in control of his creation. Very, very reassuring, especially when a couple of religious mobsters are trying to end you. Really reassuring. Their prayer is also rooted in Scripture, so they quote Psalm 2. Let's read verse 25. Through the mouth of our father David, your servant said by the Holy Spirit, why did the Gentiles rage and the people's plot in vain? The kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers were gathered together against the Lord and against his anointed. They're fully aware of Jesus in the Old Testament. It's really, really important. And as we start RBT, reading the Bible together, We're going to discuss it. We're going to learn, if we don't know already, the centrality of Christ in all the scriptures. It doesn't matter if we're reading Hosea or reading Corinthians. We will see Christ all the way through. All of the Old Testament points ahead to him. He appears in the Old Testament. The Lord appeared. Nobody's seen the Father, only the Son. The angel of the Lord, the only angel to accept worship, the messenger of God. I know many of you know this already because I've been banging on about it for five years. But we're going to see it again in the next three years as we read the Bible together. Everything they say to God was shaped by what God had said to them. That's how we pray. Our prayers are shaped, our words to heaven are shaped by what heaven has already said to us on earth. And even that verse, verse 25, through the mouth of our father David, your servant said by the Holy Spirit. There's that beautiful explanation of the inspiration of scripture. It is inerrant. We can trust what the Bible says because it's not just the words of Luke or David. It came out of their mouth, or it was written with their hand, maybe, but it's the words of God. And that's why they're trustworthy, said by the Holy Spirit. Verse 29, grant to your servants to continue to speak your word with all boldness while you stretch out your hand to heal, and signs and wonders are performed through the name of your holy servant, Jesus. They're asking for more signs and wonders. They're going to draw more attention to themselves. This will inevitably bring more persecution. More risk. But their main concern is not getting arrested. It's not being put in jail. It's not even being exiled or killed. Their main concern is failing in their mission that Jesus has set before them. That's their focus. And they know that they're going to get scared. That they're not immune to fear. They're men just like us. Elijah. I know, I I read Elijah and I think, is he really? Sure he's not an angel? The Bible tells us. No, he's just a man like us. Got afraid. That's why they're praying for boldness. Because they don't want fear to paralyze them. Gideon in Judges, full of fear, wasn't he? Hiding away, enemies all around, he's scared. And then he's told, go and remove all the idols. Take it down, your father's out, do it. 
He did it at night. People say, oh, scaredy cat. Did it at night. He still did it. He didn't let fear paralyze him. I'm sure he prayed for boldness that night. They knew they needed this boldness. They needed this help from heaven. In the face of opposition, do we pray like this? Do we trust in his power like this? When the Lord appeared to Abraham, and Abraham and Sarah facing the impossibility of, of a child in their old age, and the Lord said, is anything too difficult for the Lord? When the Lord appeared to Jeremiah, when the, the Babylonians were, the army had surrounded them all, and the Lord said, is anything too difficult for me? The answer is obviously no. No. Because even when these apostles are imprisoned and the Sanhedrin are trying to limit their influence, they begin to realize that you can't imprison or silence or limit the word of God or the spirit of God. It's impossible. So while the apostles are in jail, the message that they'd already preached is taking root in thousands of hearts. 5,000 more people come to believe in Jesus. The church family is getting bigger and bigger all the time. This is prayer rooted in scripture, rooted in God's character. It's Christ-centered. It's mission-focused. It's praying for bravery to complete the mission. I would love to pray like this more often. Would you? We had a lot of prayers like this on Wednesday night, to be fair. Praying for the persecuted church. Maybe others feel the same. I find it easier to pray for other people to be brave <laughs> when they're in prison. But what if it's us? Do we pray for that same bravery? We're going out into the workplace tomorrow, going out into the world, speaking with our families this afternoon, having lunch with unbelievers. Are we praying for boldness? We need to be, don't we? Absolutely need to be. I think sometimes, often... I'm being honest, often our prayers are more about comfort than our mission. Tranquility instead of God's glory. And so when we hear someone facing persecution, is it right just to limit our prayers to, Father, please release them from this, this persecution or alleviate the pain somehow? Or might we want to add at the end of that prayer, Lord, if you choose not to alleviate this, May the gospel advance through this struggle. May you be glorified. May your kingdom come on earth as it is in heaven. And God does answer this prayer. Peter and John might be a bit shaken up by the Sanhedrin, but Almighty God is shaking their place of prayer and he's reassuring them of his power and his presence. I'm with you. I'm here and I'm with you. I think we might need a bit of shaking up. I think we need to pray to God for boldness. So I look in awe at Christians who lay down their lives in bravery. And I, I think they do it for the sake of Jesus. And I just think, I don't know if I'd have the courage. I don't know if I would do what they're doing and... I'm reassured as I read the scriptures that these are special empowerments of the Spirit for very special work. And we need that. Verse 8, Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, said. It's a personal thing. Verse 31, when they had prayed, the place in which they were gathered together was shaken and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and continued to speak the word of God with boldness. Personally, corporately, we need boldness. Whether through persecution or through prayer, he will pour out his spirit to enable us to complete our mission and walk with boldness. Let's stand together and sing and acknowledge how great our God is together. It's an oldie but a goodie, as we say here at Wellington Chapel. How great thou art. Let's sing together.
be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. In his great mercy, he has given us new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. If you should suffer for what is right, you are blessed. Do not fear what they fear. Do not be frightened, but in your heart set apart Christ as Lord. Amen. Amen.